2019, the online summit for e-commerce sellers. Our goal at uh, Elite Conference is to help each and every e-commerce seller uh, achieve success, scale their business. Uh, we've had sessions about product sourcing, listing optimization, and also certainly uh, advanced topics such as Amazon sponsored ads. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, myself and our guest today. I'm Ankita Nagraj. I head the customer success team at Sellwrap. And we have Eitan Wiener. Um, he is, uh, okay, here it goes. Uh, he is COO <laughs> and co-founder at Quantum Networks. Uh, he is also a partner at uh, Tradeport and uh, one of the co-founders at the Prosper Show. And uh, he's um, had about uh, 10 years of experience in the industry and uh, his firm provides uh, digital marketing expertise to over 200 brands. Uh, he's been uh, featured in a lot of publications and uh, blogs. Uh, also, um, he's appeared at a lot of conferences and trade shows across the globe. Thank you so much for joining us, Eitan. It's a pleasure to host you. My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's start with our questions. Um, so you started off with online marketing, SEO and PPC almost 10 years ago. Um, you've witnessed uh, e-commerce space evolve over time. So can you talk a little bit about now and then? Sure. Um, yeah, so I started out in, in marketing, uh, online marketing. Actually, I, I started out in dental school. Um, which did not work out for me, but it was an experience. Um, I quickly went into online marketing um, and kind of fell accidentally into e-commerce, um, mm -hmm. selling products online with eBay. We built our own Magento site and evolved kind of to Amazon and Marketplace, which grew significantly um, uh, in the early years. And then since then, we kind of pivoted um, to focus on Marketplace and Amazon in a strategic way. So we work with directly with brands in an exclusive relationship and either a buy, sell, or a rev share model. Where we're doing all the added services and listings and content and ads and, and all that. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, how it's evolved, it's evolved very fast, very <clears throat> significantly. So like, again, when I started, maybe there was eBay. Uh, we started with a website, that a Magento site that I built on my own. Now Magento is not even the hot thing. Um, now we have a Shopify site. We started without Amazon. Now Amazon's a lot of our business uh, in multiple markets. Um, so, but aside from that, like major change to marketplace and Amazon and Alibaba and all those things, you know, every day there's change. So, you know, Seller App does uh, advertising and that's something that changes every day. Um, it's very exciting. Obviously there was an article yesterday about how that's a huge market. It's gonna eclipse AWS spend. And everyone's trying to look at an edge for advertising. So whether we use your software or some in-house tools, just Amazon ads alone, I think, change probably every week. So you're talking about starting listing online, you rank organically, then Google Paid comes in, you pay to get exposure and sales. Then Amazon comes along, and you're like, oh, it's awesome. You could just list the product and it will sell. Yeah. Then ads come along and it becomes like Google where you have to pay to play. And all of a sudden you find yourself getting outranked for your own brand from a Chinese seller that you don't know. And it's kind of a problem. And the bigger problem, which we try to work with big brands, tier one, tier two brands, is they don't get it. It comes so fast. And they're used to retail, and they're used to selling to Amazon retail. Now Amazon retail is getting rid of vendors that are below a certain amount or that don't play by their rules. And they don't understand marketplace. So we try to help these brands whether we're buying their product or we're consulting and managing their product. And they have huge organizations that just don't know how to deal with Amazon. So we kind of do because we've been doing it for 11 years, but every day it changes. So even within Amazon, ads change, uh, performance changes, fulfillment changes. Um, so I guess that's the higher, the, the thing that I always speak about is how everything changes every day. And you always have to be on top of there. It's reading, or watching webinars or conferences like this to know how to get ahead. Everyone, another shift, just if I'll finish with this, is, is in the model. So we used to start off selling, we were selling on Amazon, we were selling online, we were selling some niche tech products. Amazon was much easier then, and we were pretty close with some of the reps at Amazon where we were just like, they had more products, and we were selling toys, and we were selling everything. 
which is kind of scattered, but it led to a lot of growth and learning um, and improvement in processes and understanding. But it also led to fragmentation, and their web, then our website was kind of neglected. The point is that at that point in Amazon, you could kind of sell everything. And then people were like, hey, I can't sell something on Amazon. It's too complicated. There's too much competition. Let me make my own product. That's the whole private label segment, which, which you guys deal with as well on a different ad perspective. I'm going to go to China. I'm going to go to India. I'm going to go anywhere and make a product and have my own brand. That was very hot. Um, and then now that's also becoming difficult because there's so many Chinese factories going direct and there's so many private label. There's not that much left on the Amazon resale side that's kind of unique. Um, there's always opportunity, which I'll get to one of the later questions, which you could kind of carve out. But having said that, now there's a shift back towards e-commerce uh, websites like Shopify and Instagram and social. So like that's kind of the life cycle of how it's evolved. Very fast, very significant. And I'm sure we can go into more detail on the other questions. But I guess the theme is that you always have to be on top of what's changing and read about it and learn about it and try new things and fail and fail. That's the only way to succeed here. It's really, really fast paced. And, and for the old school type companies that are too much in retail that have been hearing the, reading the articles every day in the journal about every Wall Street Journal or whatever publication about every company going out of business in retail, you have to change now. You shouldn't be scared of Amazon. You don't necessarily want your product there. That's fine, but you have to know how to deal with it. If you don't, you're really risking your business. And it's yeah. unfortunate to say that because they're very powerful and arguably monopolistic, but that's just how the world is now. And you need yeah. to have a strategy. Couldn't that's uh, yeah. okay. That's my, uh, that's my evolution piece. I, I, I could go on all day, but yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and um, uh, the mindset about, uh, you know, just uh, constantly learning and adapting is extremely important because um, a lot of the sellers that I talk to, they come with the mindset that, hey, I, I have already uh, learned everything that I need to know because I watched uh, a couple of videos about how to sell on Amazon. And uh, they launch on Amazon, then they realize that it's not what it is. And then they start cripping about, Oh, Amazon is not uh, doing this for me, doing that for me, which, you know, you always have to adapt to what Amazon is doing or. Yeah. I, I also want to stress, this is something that I always mention, and I've said it from day one. I've said it at Prosper yeah. uh, several times. There's no shortcuts <laughs> in life and business. There's no passive income. Yeah. I have a lot of friends who are, you know, they're working. They're like, oh, I'm going to sell on Amazon at night. I'm like, oh, interesting. How, how's that going to work? Oh, we're going to find some products and list them. While that was true in 2011 and 12, if you got in in the gold rush, it's yeah. far from true now. And you actually wind up hurting yourself because you make positions or you take inventory. You're not doing it in the day. Maybe you're doing it a few hours a night, which is great. I admire the hustle. Yeah. But as you know, like anything in life, if it's a real job in a business, if you want it to be that, if you just want it to be a cute thing where you make a few hundred dollars, okay. But if you want it to be real, then you need to spend a lot of time on it. And if someone tells you they succeeded without spending a lot of time on it, then they're lying to you, like most things in life. It takes a lot of time, talent. There's a little luck too. You know, as they say, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, you have to have the experience and know-how. It, it's so detailed now with all the new rules and, and all the ads that yeah. you need to like study it like as if you're you know, a physician. You need to know everything about it to succeed. Yeah. If you want to be a stay-at-home mom and you know you want to just make X amount of income maybe, but to make a business out of it, it's a real business. Just because it's online and you could have a virtual worker overseas and everything's automated it and you could use seller app and all these tools, that's great. That helps. But you need to work really hard. It doesn't replace that effort. Um, so I, I really dislike um, these courses that come out like, oh, you know, watch my Get Rich Quick course. Um, come to China with me. You'll find the product and you'll be amazing and wealthy and have you know 17 Lamborghinis, it doesn't work like that. Maybe one out of a million guys in the course could do that. And you know, when the Prosper Show came out, we were like all about education. Since then, a lot of shows came out that are good, and they're this whole private label movement, make a product, you know, get rich on Amazon. But to your point, not only, not only to my previous point of keeping up with what's going on, but um, these like little, we call them, uh, like nuggets, little nuggets like, hey, do you know you could do this? Do you know you could do video ads? Do you know that you can do, you know, Amazon refurbishing? Whatever it may be, those are all good to know. 
what people lean to, unfortunately, especially in some of the stuff that in your software world that manager monitors reviews and feedback are some of these gray black hat tactics where you're trying to game the system. So in, in, in adding to my theme, which is really what I wanted to say, not only are there no shortcuts, but when you hear of a shortcut and someone's like, hey, I got the shortcut. I know this guy in China and he told me to do this thing to the algorithm. It's not going to work long term. Yeah. And you're building this house of cards where you, you, you predicate your business on the model. And as you know from your clients, they have a lot of reviews and all of a sudden their product drops and they ask you why. And you say, well, are you doing things by the book? And they say, well, I heard about this trick and everyone does it. I find it very um, hypocritical, although everyone's guilty of this, I think, where I went to a conference, actually, a mastermind before Prosper. And the whole room was saying, we have to work hard to diversify from Amazon. It's too mm -hmm. much. We have too many eggs in that basket. We have to get onto Shopify. We have to do B2B. Yeah. We have to go to China. But the other theme of the day for me was, what are all the tricks that I can do to beat Amazon? How can I get my product to rank better? How can I get more reviews? How can I play the game? So on one hand, you're saying we have to get off of Amazon because we know it's that important thing that makes the money. And on the other hand, you're saying, how do we trick it? And a lot of times the people that trick it get suspended and they lose the thing that makes the money. So which is it? So I think the answer is focus on Amazon, but don't do the tricks. Just work hard and you'll be rewarded or pivot as much as you can. And also diversify 100%. You need to diversify. That should also be a theme here. So, you know, Seller App works with Walmart. You guys are looking at other marketplaces. They're, those are tough marketplaces. They're, they're very primitive in their construct, but they must be adopted because they're either going to roll up together or going to compete with Amazon in a way. And, and you as a business need to be diversified. I've seen too many people put all their eggs in Amazon and go out of business overnight, especially the guys who do it, you know, at night or on the weekend or stay at home moms because they don't have anything else. So that was a little soliloquy, but I think it, I think the point's understood. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I was watching this other video, other interview of yours, and uh, I absolutely love your quote. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Oh, I said and that I before, think, right? That's, yeah, that's you, my line. you said that yeah. before, and it completely res resonates with me because that's what it is. You know, uh, there's no, like you said, there's no shortcut. Uh, there's there's um, luck, and people people believe in luck, and whether it's from God or different things, but you have to put in that effort. Absolutely. And then it, it should come and you have to fail a lot. I also don't like that um, in life in general or in, you know, you tell these crazy stories of celebrities and wealthy people and Bill Gates and you don't realize all the stuff they went through and all the hardship. And you're going to get your account suspended maybe, whether it's your fault or not. You're going to have cash flow problems. Your ads will be messed up one day and you'll waste money or you'll have a product suspended because you didn't do anything wrong. You have to know that and be tough about it going in or this is really not for you because it's, it's, it's scary. It's a lot of money and, and, you know, your family and livelihood. So it's a problem. Hence why you need to diversify. So it's not only harder you work, luckier you get, but you also develop thicker skin to know that like you're going to have these pitfalls. So it's not that like, Oh, just do this and everything's great. Yeah. You know, using like, like a seller app tool is great because you can see what's going on in your company what's going on in your business. Well, how are my ads doing? How much am I spending and what am I making? Yeah. That's the biggest challenge on Amazon, which has always been the case. And I still argue that majority of sellers, maybe up to 70, 80%, probably 50, 60% don't know how much they're making, but 80% don't know how much they're making to the T. Absolutely. Because to integrate it with books and QuickBooks and integrations is almost impossible. The fees and the re reimbursements, which we'll talk about in the later question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, in the good old days when we were doing tons of revenue, didn't really have a good understanding of how much money we we're making or losing. You know, in retrospect, I don't know if I care as much because I learned through that process. It would have been nice to make some money too, although I probably didn't. Um, it's a process. But now I know to look at fees, to look at ads, to look at exactly. dashboards. And, and I know that they always change. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, that's a brilliant segue to our next question, right? Uh, I actually have two questions about that. Um, so the first one is, um, what are your biggest learnings in your career? And um, the second question um, that I was going to ask is, uh, a lot of people don't realize where their revenue is leaking, right? So they have all of these tiny, tiny things that are sucking all their money without them realizing. And uh, at the end of the day, that's going to hit their profit. Right, so which you brought, brought it up. Uh, so, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, the first. What was the first question? What, what are your that? biggest learnings in your career? Yeah, I think I said the learnings. Yeah. Um, I probably spoke a little too much about that, but <laughs> one is harder you work, luckier you get. Always yeah. try and always try different things. Always try new betas and programs and marketplaces. Yeah. Um, um, having to pivot and change and be ready for failure and not take the shortcuts. I think common business things that most people would say, applying it to this hot growing Amazon world. Um, those are some of the themes. Um, the second question about um, areas where maybe you're losing money or not tight yeah. on, right? And how you could approve that, okay. Yeah. So one area which I'll, I'll talk about, actually two or three is, one's just general profitability, which I mentioned before, you need to know what you're making. You need to know the Amazon fee and the category and the commission and the shipping on a product um, with a dashboard, with a tool, however you want, but you need to know it. Um, and we need to, after the fact, understand if you're actually making that money. Sometimes Amazon charges fees for wacky things. Sometimes they make mistakes. And whether it's their mistake or they don't, or it's your mistake, you need to be on that. They're not just going to credit you the money. Um, so one thing I recommend to sellers is to use an auditing tool or service. Um, I actually built a tool in-house many years ago um, for auditing Amazon errors. So that when you ship to FBA, there's lots of discrepancies with damaged, missing things, missing parts on removals, wrong category charge, returns after X days. There's so many, unfortunately. But when you're doing millions and when, yeah. when there's so much volume, there's going to be mistakes. So even if it's 1%, that could still be, you know, half a million dollars. And that's money that's going straight back to your bottom line that they're losing. And usually if you open a case, they will credit you. But like anything, it's an expertise. How do you do that? So we used to do it in-house. I built a software. Like I think early on, I think I was one of the first to actually come up with this idea to build a software for it. And then we had a whole challenge in our company if we're a software company or, or not, <laughs> which I'm sure you could relate to because we're not a software company. That's why we use software like yours and others. And then we customize as needed because it's just not what we do. And as you know, you can keep on patching and, and editing software. It just never ends. And that's not what we do, although it's a great SaaS model if you can succeed. Um, so I wound up looking to the market for another service that did it because the one that I built or this company that came out of that, actually someone else built a company from some of this, these tools I built and it did very well and used a different company. And then I actually work with a company now called... Um, it's called Getida, G-E-T, getida.com. It's called, stands for Get Intel, Intelligent Data Analytics. And they do an excellent job. Um, most of these players usually charge a percentage. So if they get you back X, they take a percentage. Um, and often people see who's better by how cheap they're getting, what percentage they're getting. But it's not about that. It's about how much money are you getting back? How many case types do they go after? How many claims do they look at? And do they fight it? And Amazon says, no. And you're like, no, actually, you're wrong. This is why. And I've been able to get back hundreds of thousands of dollars a year through the service um, on the removal side and the return side and, and all that great stuff. So that's something that I think everyone has to look at, um, whether it's this company, um, getida.com, or there's many other refund tools. There's Refund Sniper. There's Seller Locker. There's, there's like at this Prosper show that I started, the first year there was one company that was part of that company. I kind of got off the ground with the idea. And at this last Prosper show, four years later, there are about six companies like this. And they all have a different flavor. That's something that I think is just very basic. So uh, reimbursement, refunds, auditing tool. It's kind of free money. Um, a tool like Seller App or any dashboard tool. Yours is interesting because you actually have profitability dashboard and you also have ads management. Those are two categories to me. So at Prosper, the first year, we had no ads tools because ads didn't exist. The second year, 
someone launched an ads tool, the first one ever, I think it was Ignite, like pre, oh, pre, okay. pre beta. Um, and then the third year, I would say we had like four or five. And the fourth year, we probably had like 14. This year more, you know, hence, you know, your competition in a way. Um, a tool for ads to monitor ad spend. Our ad spend went up. We have a unique model based on our margin on how we use ads, which is why we like to do some things manual or we use seller app for some things or we use other tools depending on the, the client or the relationship. But our ad spend went up three to four times for the same stuff. So let's say our A cost was always three or 4% or whatever. We're still there, but we're spending two or three or four times more. You know, whether the brand subsidizes it or not, ads are just so much more expensive. A, because there's more people doing ads and it's popular. B, because it leads to more sales and ROI. But it's becoming more like Google in that regard. So if you don't have a tool like Seller App or any of these guys, it's very hard to tell what's going on. You could use the Amazon tool, which is kind of evolving, but it's way light years behind what Google has. So someone who's typical to a Google model getting into Amazon ads, if you don't have a Seller App type tool, you're kind of in the dark. Um, and as you guys know very well, every day there's new features and there's bid plus and this DSP and all these terms I don't even know anymore. I, I have a team on that. I just, I can't even keep track to keep on changing AMS, AMG, GMG. I don't even know. Uh, 1P, 3P, it's all different, but you need to know it and you need to be on top of it. Keywords, et cetera. Um, so that's, so there's auditing tools for, for price. Um, there's dashboards like what you guys do. Um, so you guys have a nice plan to, let's say a dashboard and for profitability, visibility, and also ads and tying that together. So you can see the organic growth inside and then you also have reviews. You guys have a nice uh, offering for, for, for certain sellers. Um, another thing I would say is this other company I'm involved with, Tradeport, is returns. So we spoke about auditing, but what about the returns that you get back? So we used to get back tons of returns high-end items with not the best margin. And if you don't have a good return disposition, you're kind of out of money there. And there's a lot of returns on Amazon, as people know, whether they're legitimate or not. Amazon's super liberal. Free returns, free label, you know, buy 14 shoes and you could, you could return 12, no problem. And um, what does a seller do with the returns they get back? So we actually outsourced a lot of our forward logistics, if not all, to different 3PLs and warehouses across the country and the world. Um, but returns, we kind of didn't. So it was in the warehouse and it's kind of an afterthought. But all of a sudden you start to have millions of dollars of returns and you need to have, you have, you need to have a, a disposition. So a lot of the returns, we could send back to the vendor. Some of them we have to refurbish. Some of them we have to sell on eBay. And we would just list them online and we would get our eBay account suspended because no one was really owning that process even though it was a very big revenue bucket. So long story short, I found this company, Tradeport, that was we're kind of experts in, you know, reselling, refurbishing, repair. And I was kind of the guinea pig client for this whole Amazon space. So all my Amazon removals, we built a software where the removals come to Tradeport. We can test, grade, refurbish, repair the products. And we could either return them to the vendor for you. We could refurbish and sell, sell them as Amazon Renewed, which is like a Amazon program similar to eBay where you sell like used products at a renewed status. So you could get like 20 to 30% more value than just selling something open box. Um, we could do that. We could do wholesale. We could do destruction. But the point is it's totally like out of sight, out of mind. The returns come to us and we do whatever we can to maximize the value. So I guess it's a little pitch for our service, but it, the truth is, and there are some others that do it. Um, there are guys in their basement that do it and there are larger companies that do it. But the truth is there's not that much competition it's mostly like wholesalers who will just buy it and sell it ten cents on the dollar, which doesn't really help the brand or where the product will wind up. So I'm not really trying to just promote Tradeport, which I am involved in for full disclosure, but that concept, you don't have to use Tradeport. You can use anybody. You could use you could do it in your basement. You could find another company that does it. But you have to have a strategy for it. What happens when the items come back? Do we send them back to the vendor? How long do they sit? Can we repair them? How can we maximize the value of each item? What happens when Amazon sends back the wrong item? Do we open a claim? Do we not care? What happens if we don't ever get the box back? Um, does the brand allow us to sell it as 
refurbished? Will they allow us to return it for credit or replacement? Most of the brands I deal with, a lot of them don't understand, like, why are you returning all this stuff? Some of these higher end audio brands. Why do you have all these returns? I say, well, if we're selling millions of dollars and the return rate is 5%, we're going to have a few hundred thousand dollars of returns. So they want the reason for return and they want all the data. So I send that, but usually it's the, the, the answer that someone gives on Amazon, like, oh, I didn't like it or it didn't work, which as you know, often, unfortunately, people just lie and they say that because they want to use it for the weekend or because they messed up. So, or so they can get a free return label, which Amazon will give them anyways. So you wind up with lots of stuff, excuse me, that shouldn't be returned and the brands don't get that. The brands are used to retail where there are returns, but not too many because it's a pain to return. Um, but on Amazon, it's so easy. So the brands have to understand how to deal with it. And when we have a lot of volume and all of a sudden we're trying to send this stuff back for credit, they, they question why. And it's very, it's very important to be clear to them up front why, what the return rates will be, and that we need to be able to send back the items or at least sell them as refurbished or something, but not to not be accounted for. As we grew and we were signing up all these brands, we didn't have a strategy for each brand. So you wind up with a pile of stuff and no plan on what to do with it. So that's key to any seller. Even if it's private label and you're making it from a factory, what if you have excess? What if the stuff doesn't work? You have to have an agreement with the factory where you can send it back, even to China. Um, so that's like another point. So we spoke about auditing and details and um, mistakes that Amazon makes, leakage. We spoke about visibility, pricing, dashboard, ads. We spoke about returns, which is more on the physical side, but just as important. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, I want to make uh, the uh, advice uh, uh, more actionable. So I'm going to ask this question. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah. So uh, one of the things that we've observed is uh, when sellers get to a point where the business stabilizes and the sales and uh, uh, revenue starts uh, plateauing. In such a scenario, uh, what is your advice to them? Like, how can they scale up uh, to the next level? Do they pump in more money into PPC and marketing? Or do they expand their product line? Or do they completely pivot into something completely different? Like, how do they, how, what do you think they should do? Are you talking like any seller in general or a specific um, segment? I am mostly uh, talking about private labelers. Uh, that's, yeah. uh, th that's what we do. It's a common problem. So you yeah, come up yeah. with a private label product, Yeah. right? I know a guy, let's say you're making, I don't know, uh, desk organizers, right? Yeah. Um, and you have a good product and it's ranking well, and maybe you're making some good money, but as you know, there's always going to be competition, people copying you or Amazon copying you. Um, you plateau one one idea which is hard so like if someone has like this nuanced idea and they make we, we have it also so we, we private label actually accessories mm -hmm. so we don't really have like full finished product but let's say we'll we'll make this uh mouse pad with our blue oh, coil okay. brand and we'll bundle it with you know this headset or we have a kind of um i'm trying to have it next door um we have different products that are audio related and we'll bundle different value-added accessories to, to make a value-added solution. So you're not just getting this headset, but you're getting the charger and the stand and this and that. Oh, okay. That's the way we enhance it to be creative. But, but what's more, I guess we've tried it in the past, but to actually private label more of our own like branded products. Um, it's challenging in general with manufacturing and costs and all, the, all those things and ads, but also ideas. So if I have this great desk or organizer, what's my next idea? A lot of people have like one hit wonders or one idea and then it's okay. But then all of a sudden, maybe it makes them a living or not, but then that's it, right? How do they, they plateau. Yeah. So if you're in, in gen, you know, have more ingenuity and creativity, you can, you could do a couple of things. You could, you can go visit the factories that are making a product. You can see what else they have. A lot of times they're making products for different companies all over the world and see what else they already have and call your own, which is not so creative, but it's an easy way to make another desk organizer. You could change the color, you could change the size, you could do things like that. Um, that's just kind of low hanging. You know, I would, it would be nice if everyone had a million ideas and they could just make new products all day. That's obviously the way to do it, to keep on adding more and more products. Yeah. You have a desk organizer and then you have a desk pen holder and then you have a desk stand. Not everyone could do that and there's different costs and mold costs to do that. So start with what else the factory has, 
then look into different color variations, things like that. Um, and if you could, if you're so creative, you could look at the other product lines. As we know, in this world today, you can kind of make anything in China or um, other countries. You can, you may may not be your comfort zone to sell power banks, which I probably don't recommend because there's a billion of them. But there's some niche products. I always like my my typical business has been to look for niche. So like it's a lower lower volume or higher higher margin, more specialty products that have that value. Another thing you could do on the plateau side, aside from diversifying the products that you make by the factory suggestions, by the color, by the type, or going to a different category is to go into a different market, right? So Amazon keeps pushing it. It used to be more difficult, but um, you could sell in UK, you could sell in Germany and Spain, and Europe was difficult. Um, They kind of streamlined the VAT process. So Brexit aside, it's pretty clear what your margins are there or what they're not. So just like you ship from China to US, you could do UK. I know a lot of sellers who, who, who do amazing in the US, Chinese sellers, US sellers, but they don't touch, they don't touch Europe. And actually Europe has more customers combined than the US does. So it's kind of very low hanging, a little different model. The ads are a bit harder. The languages are different, but there are services like yours and there are translation services and there's tons of service providers that will help with that. Tradeport helps with returns from, for international as well. And the reimbursement service I mentioned helps with that too. Um, so go to different markets, just Amazon, let's say you sell on Amazon. They just open Singapore and uh, UAE, which you would think is, a bit obscure, but I hear people doing really well in Dubai because it's a very wealthy market and used to be a different marketplace that Amazon bought and they're just hungry for products. So in the past in our company, I've been kind of not first to market, but early to get stuff out there. Sometimes that's a challenge because you're doing too much and you're on too many places. But if you focus a bit on each marketplace, you could really grow. So instead of plateauing, you're just adding that same business to so many markets. So that's the high level idea of not switching your product or color or type, but just growing market or think about getting into retail. Think about getting into other venues. Think about getting into to China itself, which is complicated, but very huge to say the least. So those are, those are some areas. I don't know if you want some more. Interesting. Um, no, I think that completely makes sense. You know, diversifying in terms of uh, products, it could be platforms, or it could be marketplaces. Uh, in general, just uh, increase your market size, whatever, or, or rather, like, uh, people that you're uh, catering to. Um, so that completely makes sense. So um, <clears throat> my next question is also going to be about scaling up, but it's slightly different. Uh, I want to know if you've uh, come across, I mean, if you've um, noticed any pattern uh, in terms of uh, common mistakes that people make while scaling up, you know, I, going in the right, uh, wrong direction or, you know, going with the wrong trend. Yeah, I think I alluded to some. It obviously changes as the industry evolves, but if it's private label, you know, maybe going too deep on a product or not visiting the factory, let's say if you want to focus on private label, um, reordering large quantities and then the Mm -hmm. quality goes down, not doing the proper quality control or not monitoring the ads on the product, not monitoring the returns. All of a sudden you sell something, it becomes competitive, you plateau to the previous question and then um, you just keep on selling it, but you're losing money. Like, why, why are you doing that? Do you have a, like a seller app tool that shows you you're losing money? Do you know that? And if you know that, so that's a common mistake, just like you yeah. know what's going on. Um, I don't know my profitability. Biggest problem. Most people don't. Um, and then once you do, or if you do, um, even though I said before that it's good to, to sell in lots of marketplaces, one at a time, right? You don't want to sell in Australia and Dubai and everything overnight. I like to think like that, but that doesn't work practically. You need to do one at a time, perfect it. The U.S. is a huge market, so start there, perfect it. Then you could do the U.K. Then you could do Dubai, but like one at a time. Um, Because if not, similar to what we mentioned about relying on Amazon, if Amazon U.S. US is your main bread and butter, then it's nice to scale to, you know, Singapore, but that's not going to be your bread and butter. So 
slowly do that or have a different employee that works on that while you still baby the thing that is bringing in the money. Um, yeah. So people getting scattered and doing too much or, or as I said before, taking these shortcuts and these tricks or these black gray tactics that just wind up hurting you. Um, scaling also on the logistics side, whether you do your own warehouse, how do you manage returns? Do you outsource warehousing? Can you handle the holiday rush? The seasonality is very difficult. The storage fees in FBA, which become cost prohibitive, all these things, I mean, I could go on forever. But those are problems that people face with growth um, at a high level. I don't know if you want me to elaborate on, on any of those or add if some. You, if you think that um, uh, there are a few areas that uh, most sellers go wrong with, um, you can elaborate on that. I think high level, it's profitability or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, maybe doing too many things at once and too many markets yeah. at once. Um, within private label, maybe going too deep on certain products and not yeah. understanding that what's going on with them, um, which leads to plateau. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are the high level themes. Within that, there's probably hundreds of examples of what you do wrong when you grow too quick and you don't have systems or processes in place. You don't have the software or the tools to know what's going on, yeah. which is another problem. Absolutely. Um, so uh, coming back to your profitability uh, issue, right? So when can a seller know, um, um, you know, how long to push? So obviously in the first few months or uh, in some cases uh, in the first year, it's very hard to get into profits, positive cash flow. So how, um, how and when will the sellers know that, hey, uh, I need to stop? this product is not working out for me because I've seen a lot of sellers, you know, uh, probably choose wrong product or people don't want it. Um, but they still keep pushing in the hopes of, you know, making money um, a few months down the line kind of thing. You're saying when to cut your losses? Yes. When to cut your losses? Yeah. Um, well, to, to know that you have to know what you're losing. You have to know your cost. You have to know your shipping fees. You have to know your Amazon fees. You need a tool or you could do it on spreadsheets, assuming mm -hmm. you do, and you understand you're losing money on a product, what's what's the goal? So as you know, a lot of private label sellers will launch a product and they'll spend 300% on ads and like tons of money with like a 80% ACOS cost just to get ranking. And the goal is oh, then it'll be ranked number one, it'll be a best seller, and then I could lower the spend. Yeah. But until what point? What if it's like week one, two, three, and you already spent $100,000 on ads and you have no return? Where do you see that? Where is, what's your cutoff? What's your budget for the launch? What other things are you doing? And when do you stop? Hopefully it works out. But if you just keep on throwing money at it, doesn't, that doesn't mean it works. Um, so you have to kind of have a cutoff point, whether it's based on your previous understanding of how it works or it's kind of just a trial and error. Obviously it's silly to you know, keep on doing something that doesn't work. Um, but first you need the data. And you need to understand the ad spend and you need to understand the market and you need to understand how long did it take the competitor product to rank, which you could see with different tools, but you can't go in blind. That's why you can't just do this at night. Say, hey, I'm going to launch a product and spend money and it's going to rank well because you need to be analyzing it every day if you really want to make it succeed. So I think it's important to cut off at a certain point and set that in your mind or to your employees or whoever that are going to stop at this point. Or if it doesn't work at this point, we're going to change it up and we're going to bundle the product or we're going to sell it on eBay or we're going to throw it all in the garbage and not waste our time. Um, for everyone, that's a different point. But if you don't have that point, then you could really get into a bad position. Hmm. Yeah. But you don't have any specific uh, set time frame. Uh, as to how uh, for product launches or for just profitability of a line profitability i think if you try something hard for a few months and it doesn't work you should probably stop it also depends on the cost i mean you could try you could that could be 10 million dollars or ten thousand yeah. dollars it really depends on what and what your budget is but you have to have a forecast and a budget for these things even if you're not used to doing that or you'll lose your shirt pretty quickly um there's, there's no really set time if, unless, unless I know the product or the category. If it's a competitive category and you want to start selling power banks, you really have to be very calculated to see why you're different and how much you're going to spend in a 
very concentrated market. But if you have some great, you know, amazing idea and you go launch on like a Kickstarter and there's so much momentum behind it and like it's very, you know, structured and, and has lots of positivity, then you could kind of know like, hey, I want to give this X months and see how well it does. And if for some reason it doesn't, which is often the case, you have to kind of just cut your losses um, mm-hmm. and don't hold on to the returns or the the excess and just kind of dump it even at cost or even below cost because it doesn't add, it doesn't, it doesn't, as you know, this, these stuff that don't increase in value, they just decrease and collect dust. I've been to warehouses too many from the trade port side or from just general fulfillment, like looking for partners that have clients with stuff that's been sitting there for years and years. They're paying storage fees. They're kind of emotionally attached to the inventory. Oh, I don't want to sell my returns because, because I'm going to list it on eBay or I'm going to find yeah. a way to sell it. And I'm like, dude, like you haven't touched it in like years. Uh, we, <laughs> with trade port, uh, we went to a warehouse once where we, find, we convinced the, the guy was sitting on like three, $4 million of items, like returns, electronics. And we wanted to say, Hey, we're going to sell it. We're going to list it. We'll do, you know, we'll work with you. We're, he's very emotionally attached that he's going to get to it one day. Yeah. Right. For four years, he had so much inventory that we had to get a special like workers truck, whatever to, to break it down. So it could be broken down. Cause it was like this big tall pile. So that because it, it was in his office, it wasn't even a warehouse. It was like this back room. We had to break it down just to get through the door and into a truck. <laughs> and then eventually we started selling it, and, and you know he was still sensitive about it. But the point is, you have to like outsource these things and delegate things because yeah. you're not doing it on your own. So that itself, not managing returns, not managing auditing, is a loss in itself. So when do you decide to have the experts do it because they're better at it, or you focus on growth? You focus on making your product awesome or whatever it may be, but you can't do everything. Even if you have a big company, you just, you can't. So you need to outsource certain items or you need to, you don't have to outsource them, but if it's not profitable for you and you know that, which you should, or even if it's a little more expensive to outsource, but it's out of sight, out of mind, that's the best thing to do because you don't have to focus and waste your time. You could just focus on growing and diversifying from your plateaued state. You can't diversify when you're running everything and anything and you have no time to do anything else. That I see a lot. That I see a lot of people running, running, they want to grow, but they're not delegating and they're not outsourcing and they're just stuck in the daily day to day when they want to get to a different level. It's kind of a separate conversation, but same concept. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Yeah, so I'm saving the last question. Um, I'm saving the best question for the last. Um, This is uh, going back to your uh, background with SEO and PPC. Um, So I do know that there's no one single strategy that can be applied applied across all accounts and for best results, right? But um, uh, have you discovered any unconventional strategies uh, with trial and error method that has worked uh, like wonders for you? For Amazon ads or just general? Amazon ads. Or, yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you can talk about both. Um, I think Amazon ads is interesting because as opposed to Google, which they make feature changes, but like it's such an old, relatively old system that like there's not so many surprises or changes right they have like google shopping or you know different ways you could display an ad amazon ads are so explosively growing and dynamic right from all the things i mentioned so display ads and showing ads i don't even know the terminology i told you uh these days you know (laughs) other ads other competitors products your ads on their pages headline ads you could do amazon's display network where you're doing ads on their affiliate sites I always like to try new things. And as you guys know, there's a lot of ads you could get for very cheap and get a lot more impressions and have a better rate cost, but you just have to try. So you have to spend a lot of time or have the right people or experts or outsource people using the right software, whether it's yours or others, and the right have the right skills to, to know these things. Um, but I, I'm a little out of the actual day-to-day, like what is that next best thing? I yeah. guess my approach is more like try everything. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazon has some really expensive ad platforms with video and DSP that sound crazy. But the truth is like, if you can get X million impressions, it may be worth it. So even if it costs X dollars, which often it does a lot, it may make sense, but you could also try it and see. 
And in this game of trying to get a product to rank, especially if it's private label, you need to yeah. be ahead. You need to have that edge. You can't just do the traditional ads because someone will come who's smarter or who's the factory who has better costs and better brain perhaps and just do everything you're doing. So then how do you get ahead of him? So we spoke about diversity, but what about it in just ads? So maybe I can do ads at different times of the day or you know, bid plus or whatever these, these new functions are. I'm not, unfortunately, I don't know the, I can give you some examples. I'm going to just speak more generality. Yeah. Um, you know, headline ads are good, but they're hard to track on a product level because Amazon doesn't really do that. They just kind of show you, this is how this did, but you don't really know. So you kind of have a gut feeling that it works. It's still worth pursuing, but as I keep on saying, and as you profess, like you need to have a tool that shows you what is going on. So I'm doing this, I just did bid plus, or I just did automatic bidding and I spent 10 times more. Okay, did I make that much more? Maybe not, maybe that's okay because um, I'm launching. Maybe that's really bad because nothing's selling. Um, so I don't have like a silver bullet like tool Absolutely. or idea, which I, which I, again, I don't believe in, but I, I do believe you should always try things that are that are above board and, you know, uh, per policy in terms within ads. And it's kind of amazing to me how it, how it just changes every day. I don't know how you guys keep up with all those things, um, but you need an expert doing it. Um, and I, I've seen experts in Google who don't understand Amazon ads and they say, oh, it's much easier. Maybe it's easier, but something as simple as, as you know very well is as finding keywords. You just can't find keywords. It doesn't make any sense. Amazon doesn't allow you to really see what people are searching for whatever reason. That's a whole separate discussion that I've spoken about. So you have to assume what the keywords are or reverse engineer what the other guys are bidding for, which is kind of crazy, right? Google wants you to spend a lot of money on keywords and ads. So they just let you know, bid on this, bid on this, bid on that. Amazon doesn't do that uh, for better or worse. That's kind of a crazy thing. So it's a lot of creativity. So who's running your ads? Someone who's in-house and knows how you think or someone overseas or someone in their basement and wherever that, is just doing their job, but doesn't understand what you sell. They're just like like a robot. That doesn't really help you grow. Um, you need someone who knows your business, which is why, honestly, for us, outsourcing stuff is difficult. So, like, very monotonous, like, tasks we can outsource, but, like, things that involve more teamwork, which we have a whole team here in New York, uh, it's important that the people are here. Even if it's more expensive to have it here or – Whatever, the, whatever that may be, that cost, it's just important that everyone's together. I know there's, for, for our company, I know there's a lot of companies that are all virtual and everyone's on Zoom and Skype and it works, but I've never had success outsourcing advertising um, ever. It's usually like they do one way, they don't understand the products, it's always, it never works. So we could use tools like yours to do it or advice, but we still have someone here managing it or doing it manual when the tool maybe doesn't do what we want because... As I said, there's no end to what you can try. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. Okay. So um, we've come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, Eitan. Uh, it was a My pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, it was a really um, uh, educational session. I learned so much and I'm sure our viewers have as well. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have uh, come to the end of the um, of this fantastic event, uh, Elite Conference 2019. Um, so for those of you who've missed our previous sessions, it's all up on our website. You can go view it any time. And uh, we'll be coming up with more conferences, more sessions. So um, stay tuned and watch out for our next session. So until then, thank you so much for joining and uh, being such an integral part of our uh, event. And thank you uh, for, your, for all the speakers as well. Uh, you've, you've been um, amazing. So thank you and stay tuned. Until then, thank you, goodbye.